Hello, this is Dr. Mattingly, and this is the first Collaborate for um, Oncology. It's on the incidence pathology and diagnostics. My first couple of slides are your learner outcomes, so I'm just going to click through those and not talk about them. Okay, this first slide just talks about the definition of cancer. And um, cancer is now considered to be a chronic disease with acute episodes. And the basis of um, cancer is simply that we have normal cells that mutate into abnormal cells, and then they just continue to peripherate. Um, we, cancer itself is uh, more as a group of more than 200 different diseases, and it's characterized, like I just said, from uncontrolled and unregulated growth of the uh, cells. Incidence and mortality, I've given you a lot of data here. I do want to highlight that more than 13 million Americans are living with a history of cancer. We've seen um, the uh, survivorship go up uh, consistently for the past several decades, and I'll talk about that more in just a bit. Um, I do want to touch on the fact that different ethnicities have different um, incidences and mortality from cancer, with African Americans having both the highest incidence of cancer and the highest mortality rate. Some of that has to do with the fact that um, um, African Americans in general tend to uh, seek treatment at a later stage of the cancer, so therefore it's more advanced whenever um, they seek treatment, and that results in turn in an increased mortality rate. The only thing I really want to tell you about the Human Genome Project is that it was a project that started way back in 1990, and the idea here was that we were going to map not only the 20 to 25,000 genes that are in human DNA, but also the 3 billion, yep, I said billion, 3 billion chemical pairs that make up human DNA. So the idea was that if we could better understand not only the genes, but the chemical pairings, that we could then determine if there was a genetic link to certain types of cancer. As far as survival, uh, we consider survival at a five-year survival mark, and that has now increased to 68% of everyone who is um, diagnosed. We've seen that also continue to increase steadily over the last 30 years. If you want to take a look in your book on page 248, um, there's a charts that talk about incidence and mortality um, from uh, cancer based on gender. So if you were to look at that, you would see there were differences in gender by incidence. However, you would see that the most common cause of mortality for both men and women are the same. So you might want to take a look at that. We have seen um, a decrease in mortality over time. Some of that has been directly related to the prevention and screenings that we do. For example, mammograms for breast cancer and, um, let's see, uh, colonoscopies for colorectal cancer are good examples. One area that continues to be of concern, though, um, is the increase in the incidence of melanoma. And that's because we spend so much time out in the sun and we have the tanning beds and all those kinds of things. Um, we have started to see that kind of level out a little bit, probably because that first rush of uh, really going to the tanning beds has kind of leveled out as well. From um, nursing focus, we're going to focus on a couple different things. First, on prevention. And that's where we're really trying to help uh, individuals understand what risk factors are and what each of us can do in order to reduce our risk of acquiring cancer. Then from a treatment perspective, that goes along with the diagnostics and the treatment phase. And then finally, we want to help our patients um, address the impact that cancer has had on their lives. Um, we consider cancer survival in stages. Um, the first stage is the diagnosis and treatment. We also call the first season, second season, and third season, but that nomenclature is kind of falling by the wayside. So we're going to focus on the diagnosis, treatment, extended survival, and permanent survival. Okay? Um, the diagnosis and treatment stage is exactly what it says. It starts whenever the person is diagnosed, and it ends when treatment ends. At it's uh, very common for the patient to fall into the role of being a um, cancer patient. 
Um, sometimes they take on a role of um, the cancer patient is the new identity will, and will sometimes fall into the role of the um, there's a real emphasis in diagnosis and treatment and going to appointments, following the regime, those types of things. Then extended survival begins whenever treatment ends. And then we fall into a period of what we call watchful waiting, characterized by the fear that the cancer is going to recur. Finally, we go into permanent survival, and permanent survival begins whenever the risk of recurrence is small. It's small enough that we can say we feel like the person is in permanent survival. At this point, we may have role identification issues. Up until now, what they've done, they were in the active phase of diagnosis and treatment, so they were very much a cancer patient. At standard survival, they're kind of still in the recovery phase. Um, permanent survival is when they have to come to terms with um, what has happened. So they may find that they can't do the same work that they used to be able to do. So that can be a real um, identity issue. They may find that they've got issues with health insurance or with life insurance. They, at this point, may really start to feel the burden of that economic cost of treatment has caught up with them. Some people come out of an incidence with cancer with a sense of renewed spirituality and have really strengthened the bonds within their families. And then in other situations, we have dysfunctional families where cancer kind of tears them apart. So we really just need to be in tune with what that patient's um, perspective is. Um, survivorship, this has been a really big emphasis. Starting back in 2006, the Institutes of Medicine issued a report that recommended that every person diagnosed with cancer should have an individualized survivorship care plan. Um, I've outlined for you on this slide what a survivorship care plan is. Also on Blackboard, there's a link to the American Cancer Society that you can go to that um, gives a, you an example of a booklet, which is a roadmap of sorts to help a person to record um, where they've been and provide information to help uh, the patient plan their cancer journey, so to speak. Um, so that's a resource you may want to take a look at. Clinical trials. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about phase one, two, three, and four. So phase one, the purpose is to determine the safety of the medication or treatment in humans. So as a result, you can imagine that the individuals who are involved in a phase one are typically people with very advanced disease and they've tried other op all other options. They're kind of at the end of uh, the trail of what they can try. So those are really the type of people that are going to fall into a phase one because at this point we're even trying to determine whether or not this treatment or drug is even safe for humans. It's a very small sample. Phase two. Phase two is the next uh, step. And at this point, we're testing tolerability, we're looking for what the safe dosage is, we're trying to see what the side effects are, and determine how the body is going to cope with that drug. Typically, it's going to be a randomized, blinded research design. And you're still, you've got more people than in phase one, but it's still relatively small. If the findings from a phase two show that the treatment or drug is at least as good as current treatments or the current drugs, then typically that treatment or drug is going to advance to a phase three, okay? Phase three. At this point, now we're trying to refine things. So we're trying to determine what's the most effective dose. When should we use it? What diseases, what stage of diseases is it most effective against? We want to get a better handle on what the side effects are. So at this point, you've got a very large sample. It may be thousands. It may be tens of thousands, quite honestly. This is the last phase that drugs or treatments go through before they get FDA approval, okay? Once they make it through phase three, if they're successful, that's when they're going to get FDA approval. Then after this, the phase four, the drug or treatment is out on the market, okay? It's being used. And at this point, now trying to see what's our incidence of serious side effects and also to explore whether or not there are other ways that this drug and treatment can be used. You've got a very large sample. Remember, this is after FDA approval. 
So this is where you'll see different dosages or different methods of administration of the drug or treatment as part of the evaluation. This is also the phase when you would see that drugs are pulled from the market or where you'll see drugs get approved to treat new um, stages or perhaps even new diseases. A neoplasm. I've given you the definition of neoplasm. I'm not going to read it to you. Okay. I do want you to know that neoplasms are often considered to be autonomous. And the reason they're considered to be autonomous is because they grow at a rate that's not coordinated with the needs of the body. So typically, we create new cells when we need new cells. So if we have a destruction of a certain type of cell, then our body will make new cells of that same type. But with neoplasms, they just do whatever they want. They're not associated with they're not associated with the needs of the body. They don't benefit the individual. In some cases they can harm the individual. However, a neoplasm is not totally and the reason it's not totally autonomous is because neoplasms require a blood supply nutrients and the oxygen that that blood supply provides them in order to grow. So we've got benign and we've got malignant neoplasms. The first slide here talks about benign. Again, I've given you a very nice listing here of the characteristics of benign neoplasms, so I'm not going to focus on those. I'm going to highlight a few topics. First, I do want you to know that typically a benign neoplasm is going to grow slowly or it might just grow to a certain size and then stay there and be stable at that size. Uh, benign neoplasms are going to exhibit something called contact inhibition. What that means is that when the neoplasm, when those cells are growing, that often they'll stop growing when they reach the boundary of another type of tissue. Because normal cells will stop dividing when they become crowded. And that happens because mitosis is inhibited cells contact other nearby cells, okay? But remember, benign neoplasms, although they're not cancerous, can cause damage. An example of that would be a benign meningioma in the brain. So even though it's not malignant, the mere fact you've got this tumor in the brain is causing pressure on the brain tissues and on the spinal cord. And then we end up with increased intracranial pressure gradually becomes more and more um, impactful function and eventually it can lead to coma or death. So that might neoplasm is not cancer but because of where it's located and the pressure that it is putting on the surrounding tissues can actually cause significant damage. Characteristics of malignant neoplasms in many ways, they're almost the opposite of benign. Again, I'm not going to read all these to you. I'm going to highlight a few things. First, I want you to know that malignant neoplasms grow very aggressively, and they do not respond to the body's normal hemostatic controls. They don't stop growing when they're crowded. Instead of stopping like a benign neoplasm would, a malignant neoplasm is just going to cut through the surrounding tissues. And when it cuts through the surrounding tissues, it can cause all kinds of problems. It can cause bleeding, inflammation. We can have necrosis of the area. Um, malignant neoplasms can reoccur after we have surgical removal of both the primary and even secondary tumors. We still see, <coughs> excuse me, we see that they reoccur. Um, malignant neoplasms tend to vary in their degree of differentiation from the parent tissue. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on this slide is um, give you a little bit of a definition of metastasis. Metastasis occurs when malignant cells from the primary tumor travel through either lymph or blood to invade other tissues or organs of the body and form a secondary tumor or a secondary neoplasm. Okay? <coughs> I'm going to repeat that. Metastasis occurs when malignant cells from the primary tumor travel through either lymph or blood to invade other tissues or organs of the body and form a secondary tumor. <coughs>